guys, this is Miss H again, and I'm just going to continue reading from So Be It. And we are in chapter 14, and the title is Pretty. It looked different from the photographs. Older. The shutters had been removed, and the whole place was painted dark green instead of white. Only the sign was the same. Hilltop Home. Liberty, New York. Here we are, said the driver, stopping at the bottom of the long dirt driveway. You're sure it's still open? I'm sure, I said. See? There are lights on up there. Oh yeah, I see. Well, I brought a fare up here once ago, and I think I remember there's no good place to turn around up top. So since it ain't raining no more, you mind walking up? I said I didn't mind, thank him and got out. <laughs> that was some lucky guess you made back there, kid, the driver said just before he pulled away. Man, oh man, would I give for a little of that kind of luck on a bingo night. I stood there looking up at the place I traveled all this way to get to, and it looked back down at me with half-shut window eyes and a porch mouthful of railing teeth. Listen to the eyes, Heidi. But I couldn't tell anything from Hilltop's face. Even though it wasn't that far away from downtown Liberty, only about 15 minutes or so, the storm had either skipped over the area or not reached it yet. The sky was an ominous dark gray, but the ground was still dry. As I started slowly up the steep driveway, a sudden gust of wind blew through and caught in the shaggy boughs of the old hemlock tree. Soof, they whispered softly as they swayed overhead. This time, I didn't cover my ears. I was glad to hear Mama's word there, reminding me one more time of why I had come. My shoes kicked up little clouds of fine brown dust as I quickened my pace and hurried up the driveway. Up the wide porch steps, past a couple of pots of flowers, and a pair of white painted rocking chairs with wicker seats. The square panes of glass in the front door were covered by a lace curtain inside. I knocked, but nobody answered. Setting my suitcase and the jar of jelly beans down on the porch, I knocked again. And when nobody came, I turned the knob and walked in. It smelled old and musty, like Bernadette's medicine cabinet when you first slid it open. There it wasn't much furniture in front of, in the front room. Just a vinyl couch with big round buttons on the cushions and a couple of matching armchairs. Hello, I called out, and after a minute again, hello, no answer. So I went down the hall towards the sound of the voices. I passed a large kitchen on my left with big metal pots hanging from a rack over a long counter. And on the right, a bathroom with white and black checkered floor tiles. Then came a small room set up like an office with a phone and a typewriter on the desk. The voices were coming from behind a tall wooden door at the end of the hall. And as I got closer, I was able to make out bits and pieces of what was be being said inside. There was music playing, either a record or someone strumming a guitar. David, do you want to be the cheese? I heard a woman ask. At least, that's what it sounded like, she had said. I felt uncomfortable standing out in the hall like that, eavesdropping. Hello, I called again, hoping maybe the woman inside would hear me, but the door was heavy and too much was going on behind it for anyone to hear me calling. I glanced to my right into the little office with the typewriter and phone. I hadn't noticed at first, but there was a big gray filing cabinet in there too, stuffed, so full of manila folders, and the drawers couldn't possibly have shut so many folders hundreds each one tagged with a small blue label across the top that looked like it could have a name written on it get whatever answers there are to be gotten Heidi I wish I could say I had trouble deciding what to do next but I didn't I knew it was wrong but the thought that one of those folders might contain the very truth I come so far to find made it easy once I stepped inside and closed the door behind me I found that the room was in fact considerably larger than I had originally imagined there was a separate alcove off the little office with a pattern rug on the floor, several plants and heavy clay pots, and a red armchair that sat with its high back towards me in front of a nice big window overlooking a wooded hill. Our apartment in Reno didn't get much light, so things had a hard time growing there. We tried keeping plants, ivy and jade, and even an avocado we sprouted from a pit stuck around with toothpicks and hung over a jar of water but eventually everything always died so instead bernie ordered silk plants and flowers from one of her catalogs and set them in rows on the window sills to brighten things up sometimes she even sprayed cologne on them 
Wouldn't fool a bee, but it does the trick for me, she'd say as she spritzed them with the old optimizer with the faded pink squeeze ball that had belonged to her grandmother. The plants in the alcove at Hilltop were so perfect. I wondered if they possibly could be real, especially the ones that sat right next to the red armchair. It had long, slender, pointed, dark green leaves, and off the tips of those leaves dangled strands of the prettiest flowers, so delicate and white. I just had to know for sure. I crossed the carpet and was just about to touch one of the flowers to rub the petals between my thumb and forefinger, when suddenly I gasped and had to clap my hand over my mouth to keep from crying out. I was not alone. There was a man sitting in the chair. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bother you. I thought, I didn't think, I stammered. There was nobody out front when I came in, so I, his face was turned away from me, and it took me a minute to realize that the reason he wasn't responding was that he was sound asleep. I heard the slow, even sound of his breathing as his chest rose and fell. I could have turned and left then, or taken a chance and done what I'd planned to do in the first place, go through the files looking for Mama. Instead, I tiptoed around the corner to the other side of the chair in order to see his face. His neck was bent to the side, his chin and cheek pressed down against one shoulder like a bird trying to tuck its head under a wing to sleep. His dark hair was mowed short, not much more than prickles across his scalp, and his skin was smooth and so pale. I could see blue veins plushing in his forehead. Suddenly he shifted and stirred in his sleep, and then his head snapped up and back, and he opened his eyes and looked straight at me. At his first, at first, his look was blank, his jaw hanging loose, his right cheek streaked with a red imprint from the chair's upholstery. Then all of a sudden, his face lit up with recognition, and he broke into a wide toothy grin. Soof, he said in a strange, soft, guttering voice, soof. And that is the end of chapter 14.